Welcome to MedTech Speed to Data, a KeyTech podcast. I'm your host, Andy Rogers, VP of Business Development at KeyTech. Each month, me and a KeyTecher are going to interview a MedTech leader and talk to them about the critical data-driven decisions they make in their programs. Hey, everybody. Welcome to MedTech Speed to Data. I'm your host, Andy Rogers from KeyTech. Thanks for joining once again, episode 18 here. We're going to be talking about defining performance requirements. Uh, we have Jake Copperthwaite here on the line. Jake, welcome back to the show once again. Hey, Andy. It's nice to be back on the podcast. Great. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk also about the episode we just recorded, episode 17 with Mike Acosta from CoagSense, where he described his PTINR uh, at-home diagnostic test uh, for those, those are with patients who are taking morphine. Um, he talked about his next generation platform, the Gen 3, Gen 3 platform that they're developing. It was pretty interesting with that product, how they're actually making it simpler than their Gen 2 product in, by eliminating most of the connectivity features that they had in their Gen 2 for their Gen 3, listening to their customer, the elderly patients who really just want a simple device uh, to use. Uh, the other highlight from that episode uh, I will point out and was kind of the the um, impetus for this episode is um, some of the challenges they're having with um, getting approval from FDA related to verifying their performance requirements. Uh, this is, you know, making sure the product is uh, equivalent to their on-market predicate product, their own product. Um, and they've had to go, on, go back and forth a few times with FDA, presenting more bench data. So we thought it'd be a good time to, to step back and talk with you, Jake, uh, you've managed many projects uh, where we've taken products through regulatory approval, approval through one way or the other, either an internal key tech product or, um, you know, externally with, with clients. And it always boils down to what is the product, what is the product doing, what are the performance requirements. Um, and so today, Jake, uh, we want to walk through what we concluded to be kind of the primary considerations when defining these performance requirements as you're developing your product requirements document. And the considerations we have, there's three. Step one, make sure the performance requirement is objectively verifiable, straightforward, clean cut. The second, you know, what statistical data do you need to collect to prove that the requirement is met? Um, you know, how many do prototypes will you need? What does the data actually look like? And then the third consideration when you're defining your performance requirements is related to uh, regulatory approval. What, what considerations do you need to make uh, as you're de or defining these requirements so that you'll get seamless regulatory approval? So those are the three considerations. Number one, objectively verifiable. Number two, what statistical data, how many prototypes will you need to test and prove that the product actually meets those requirements? And the third, you know, what regulatory considerations are there as you're drafting this very critical requirement, your performance requirements? So let's get going, Jake. So, so walk us through, what does it mean to have uh, a requirement be objectively verifiable? You know, this is the first consideration. Uh, so when you think about requirements that are objectively verifiable, there's four different types of verification that we use at KeyTech. There's testing, where you run a test and take measurements. There's demonstration, where you have the device perform a function and, and you know, show that it can occur as expected. There's analysis, where you, you know, maybe do calculations or uh, simulations and you analyze whether the requirement is met. And then there's inspection, where you're just doing like a visual inspection to make sure that something is, is at, um, exists as it should. Uh, so if you can't use one of those four methods to prove a requirement, then it's probably not objectively verifiable and you need to rethink how it's written. Does that make sense, Andy? It does. It does. And, and I, I would say, in my experience, aren't most performance requirements verified through testing? Yeah, most performance requirements are going to require testing. Just, Jake, for our audience, what's an example of a well-written requirement that's objectively verifiable versus one that's poorly written. I guess I'll start with the poorly written one. We see it all the time. Um, it's, it's a requirement that says the device shall be easy to use. Um, that may work well in a higher level requirement set, like a user needs, but in product requirements, you want to be more specific than that um, because you can't, really can't verify something that's easy to use. Um, you can validate it. You can do user studies and obtain feedback from users, but you really can't um, you know, run a bench top test and decide, okay, this is easy to use. Uh, so a, a well-written requirement is going to be very specific. 
and it's going to have clear acceptance criteria. Um, so to just pick an easy one, you know, at KeyTech we deal with pumps a lot and flow rates and things like that. So a requirement might be, um, you know, an aspiration pump shall have, you know, X flow rate within, you know, plus or minus Y percent. Um, it's very clear. So you have, you know, a flow rate and you have acceptance bounds. So you run a test, you prove it's within that range. Great, you move on. Um, but again, if, if you don't have, let's say, let's say you don't have uh, performance bounds, let's say the flow rate shall be X. Um, you may run the test. It may not be, you know, exactly as stated, you know, what sort of limits are allowed to consider it passing. So you need to include that as well with your requirement. So just real quick on that, that point with limits, uh, is it a fair statement to say that the, the limits of a requirement are usually driven by the risk of going outside of that, that limit? So you mentioned, you know, volumetric accuracy, for example, there's really three different values to think about. Um, and, and I guess this is another trap that sometimes folks fall into with, with requirements. Uh, so going back to the aspiration case, let's say that for physiological purposes, you need to be 5% accurate. So as long as you're within plus or minus 5%, you're gonna get the same physiological effect. Um, but maybe for safety purposes, plus or minus 10% is fine. Um, so that kind of gives you, you know, wider bounds. Um, so, so what we see sometimes is a client might find a vendor who's advertising a, a pump that let's say is plus or minus 1% accurate. So, so it's even better than they need. Uh, and, and the client might think, great, I'm going to use this pump. I'm going to set my requirement at plus or minus 1%. So that's even better than they need it to perform for physiological reasons, you know, not to mention safety. Um, but so what they've done is they've set a narrower requirement. They're using this pump. And, you know, maybe the vendor spec is based on specific testing, you know, on a bench at a certain temperature. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe it can meet that performance criteria, but then you get later on the project and you learn, you know, for that application, it's not great. And, and all of a sudden you've kind of trapped yourself because you've over specced your requirement. Um, and when really you need to te be testing to 5%, you're trying to beat something that's tighter than that. Um, so that, that's something we see a lot. Yeah. That'd be an example of market requirements, maybe pushing down to, to product requirements that, that are unnecessary. Exactly. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Great. So now going forward, we'll make our requirements objectively verifiable, particularly on the performance side, right? Um, which is a good segue to the next consideration, which is uh, before you, you lock the, your performance requirements, make sure you understand what, uh, how many prototypes you need and what sort of statistical confidence you need in meeting and demonstrating that performance requirement. So can you talk a little bit about your experience there? So performance testing is really time consuming um, and you're kind of making your luck up front. So I guess what we just talked about was how you write your requirement. And if you write it uh, in a nice clean manner, it might make, might make it easier to test than it otherwise would be. Um, but that's the testing part. The other part is, is the sample size. Um, so, you, you know, you might have a really easy test to run, but if you have to have a high sample t sample size, it could be extremely time consuming. Um, and what we see in terms of sample size is it's usually risk based. So what sample do you need to know within, you know, some confidence that you're going to meet um, some reliability bounds or acceptance um, criteria? Uh, and that and that usually drives everything. If if it's a simple test that's kind of black and white, you know, the, the pump's going to turn on or it's not then, you know, one sample might be fine. But if it's a, you know, really sensitive test where you're trying to uh, determine accuracy across, you know, different consumables, maybe different lots, then you're gonna have to set up a much larger study uh, and use a, a much higher sample size. Got it. So there was one project I, I'm aware of here at KeyTech where we actually hired, so in lieu of tens or potentially hundreds of prototypes, in lieu of that, we developed this sophisticated uh, design of experiments plan and got the confidence that we needed with, with less prototypes. When would that make sense, Jake? Yes. So what we've done it is, is relatively early in development. So maybe, maybe a late alpha or a beta device. Uh, and what a, a DOE, a design, design of experiment, will do is it will help you understand sensitivities. Uh, so at the time, I think there were seven critical uh, variables and we want to understand you know the impact of each 
So we hired a consultant. He came to KeyTag. I think we met for a couple of days. And he helped us design this experiment where if you take, I don't know, you know, five or 10 devices and test them in different environments with the variables set differently, you can accumulate this huge pile of data and, and process it and tease out what the various sensitivities are. Um, and, and the great thing about that is you're getting it all at once. And so instead of setting up, you know, seven independent studies to look at each variable specifically, we could just run this, you know, kind of one massive study and obtain everything at once. And, and that was really helpful because at the end of it, we were able to understand, you know, okay, um, you know, this variable barely changed. So, you know, we, we ran it at the extreme, um, extreme of the range for that variable, maybe in a cold environment, maybe in a warm environment, maybe with a different person operating the instrument. And we could see, okay, you know, it basically remained flat. Whereas some of the other variables we could see, you know, very significantly. And that told us that those uh, variables that had more variation needed to be studied uh, more extensively during the project. Gotcha. And there's, there's real value to be had there. I mean, you're not building multiple prototypes that for some of these complex platforms can be 50, 75K each. So I can see the value there. And also just the general value of understanding which variables are of interest uh, to then beat on with those um, small number of prototypes you've already built. So it made, made sense in that in that case. Absolutely. And and the, I guess the, the other fact is we could automate everything. Uh, so, you know, with automated testing, not only have you reduced the number of tests you need to run, you're also more efficient because you can set it up over, you know, a week and then come back and look at the data. So it was, it was extremely efficient. This is also another, I think, example of where marketing might drive product requirements. But I guess in your experience, where have you seen these um, confidence uh, levels come from? Like you, you need 99% confidence you're going to hit this requirement. Where, where, do the, where does that come from? Some of our uh, global clients will have their own internal procedures and it will be risk-based. So, you know, minor, minor moderate, major. Um, and if it's, if it's a major level of concern or, or major risk, then they're going to require high confidence, you know, high confidence that they're meeting, um, you know, their specified requirement. If it's, if it's uh, let's say, lower, um, you, know, you know, minor concern, you maybe you don't need that high confidence because if it falls a little bit outside the range, it's not going to have any clinical impact um, or, you know, affect the, the patient in any way. Uh, and then the, the other end of the spectrum, I guess, would be the startups and smaller companies who don't have those internal policies. And for that, they're going to be, you know, hopefully looking to um, what other, other companies have done. They're going to be talking to the FDA to try to get some input and establish their sample sizes. Yeah, Jake, you just gave away the third consideration, which is making sure you have FDA or general regulatory buy-in on your performance requirements before you go uh, submit your design history file. So talk a little bit more about getting this you know, FDA and, and regulatory buy-in on these critical performance requirements. So the first thing you should do is you know, internally use your own judgment of what you think the sample size should be. And that's a combination of engineering expertise, so understanding the sensitivities, as well as clinical ex expertise, so assessing the risk. Um, so you, sh you should come up with a plan internally, you know, what sample size do you plan to have, what testing do you intend to perform, and then you should get in touch with the FDA. Uh, and there's a thing called pre-sub meetings, or also called Q-sub meetings. That's where you would present your plan to the FDA and have them provide feedback. Um, you, you know, do they agree with your sample size and your test approach? or would they like to see you do something different? And in that meeting, I'm assuming you want to have data in hand, right? The preliminary prototype data showing that, okay, look, we're, we're already meeting the requirement. This is our plan as we go into formal VNV. You'd, you'd like to have some preliminary data, yeah. Uh, especially if you can show, well, you know, going back to the design of experiment, if you can show studies you've done that have established where the device is sensitive and where it's not, I think that's, you know, really helpful uh, in justifying your your sample size decisions to FDA, going into a pre sub meeting, Jake with with FDA, you know what are they what are they looking for at, at a high level with your, with your product you're trying to get approved. So the goal is safety and effectiveness, and and in a PRD you're going to have all sorts of requirements. You're going to have some related to safety, you know to to pick an example, complying with IEC sixty six zero one. For electrical safety that would be an example of safety requirement um you're, you might have effectiveness requirement well you will have effectiveness requirements 
and th those might be based on uh, a predicate device. So if you're going to go the 510K route, you're going to look at a similar product. Um, what sort of performance does it have? Um, you know, what are the accuracy criteria? What's the resolution? Those sort of things. You're going to want your requirements to be as good or better. So, so those are critical. Um, but you're also going to have other requirements um, that may, may come from marketing. They, they may help sell the product. Uh, they're not related to safety and effectiveness, but they're going to differentiate the product and make it more successful on the market. So, so when you go into the meeting with the FDA, the focus really will be on safety and efficacy. Uh, and you want to make sure you have a good plan for the sample size to test those, um, as well as the procedure to test those. And then the other ones, the more marketing related requirements that, that don't really fall into those two categories, they're going to have less emphasis, but you know because they're part of your design input, you still need to meet them. It just may not be as rigorous of testing. Yeah, I mean, I've never actually been in one of those pre-sub meetings, but I, the only uh, feedback I've heard is going to those meetings prepared, and 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 communicating your plan, and not uh, asking kind of high-level abstract questions because they'll, they'll see right through that, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think you can waste a lot of time if you if you're not presenting a plan to begin with. Um, it's it's not a brainstorming session, you know, where FDA is helping you figure out how to test a product. It's more you've done your homework, you're proposing a plan, and you're getting feedback on that. All right, Jake, thanks for your words of wisdom here today, you know, related to defining performance requirements, uh, one of the key requirements in a broader product requirements document, which is linked in our bio here, <laughs> uh, down in, in, uh, in the episode here, uh, where we have a whole uh, – flowchart for defining requirements, as well as a template that you can download uh, for a product requirements document. But related to performance requirements, which are the most critical, Jake, you outlined the three main considerations. The first, absolutely, the product or product requirements need to be objectively verifiable. Secondly, you need to have a plan uh, for the number of prototypes to build so that you can get the appropriate statistical confidence that the product will meet those performance requirements in the market. And lastly, uh, arrange for a pre-sub meeting with FDA where you outline uh, your requirements and they're gonna focus primarily on the, the performance requirements uh, related to safety and efficacy of the, of the product. Uh, so that's it here from KeyTech. Again, check out the link below to download uh, the product requirements document template or look at the flowchart for how you actually define various requirements. Uh, until next time, Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to MedTech Speed to Data, a key tech podcast. Join us each month for more ways to get the right data faster to inform critical decisions. Find additional resources on our website, keytechinc.com. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And please leave a review on iTunes whenever you listen. Thanks. Thanks.